Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. We for 20 years have been preserving the birth of America's space age right here in Brevard County that we call the delivery room of America's great space age. And today uh, going to brag a little bit about our staff and people here uh, in the museum led by Karen Conklin, our wonderful executive director for the last three and a half years as we at the was voted by the Chamber of Commerce, the Cocoa Beach Chamber of Commerce, we won the Nonprofit of the Year Award. And there was a quite, I thought, stiff competition from the Veterans Memorial and, and Warbirds Museum and all kinds of other nonprofits, about eight of us vying for this. But we brought home the bacon team and so happy to represent our museum. There I uh, pictured, I should, not cover up that pretty lady, but cover me up there, there. That's Jennifer Sugarman, who's the outgoing president of the Cocoa Beach Chamber of Commerce, and she's gone to a new job at Northrop Grumman, just a fabulous lady. Uh, and when I become involved with the Chamber of Commerce a few years ago, that was our goal, was to put the American Space Museum back on the map. Not that people have forgotten about us, but people had forgotten about us because of the end of the shuttle era, not many people come to the Space Coast to see launches and now lots coming back. The energy is great and we're so proud of our team and I'm so proud to represent them to win the Nonprofit Business Champion of the Year American Space Museum for the Cocoa Beach Chamber of Commerce. And we also wanted to show you something else there real quick that we have revealed to you this, our, our Galaxy of Giving. And this is our first constellation in the galaxy of giving, the heart constellation. And we are sending this out to people on this, like Hazel Banks. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, Tom and Mark Usiak, I know they're watching. You're going to get a little special something in the mail showing how you contribute to our first constellation of the galaxy of giving. And we're going to have so many of you donors, stars up there, big and small stars, the big star there. Uh, in the called West is from the Marie Louise G. West Endowment that's helping us do oral histories, and we're going to ramp that up uh, immediately starting tomorrow. So uh, can't say enough though. Jessica put up there the stars of giving there, and uh, uh, we wanted to give a shout out to every Mike McCulley's the astronaut there. Larry Osterley at the top is a space uh, uh, CE uh, businessman. Conklin on the left is Mark and Karen Conklin, our executive director and husband. The Martinos, uh, Anne Marie and Pete help us a lot. Joanne Morgan's at the bottom, John Tribe. We've got the Galloways, Jessica Galloway, our engineer behind the computer is there. Uh, and Wine Coop, that is uh, the couple from my high school, Patty uh, and, uh, Wine Coop and her husband, uh, Randy. Uh, met in high school, probably working on almost 50 years being married. And uh, so many ways you can give. Did I mention everybody? I think I did. But God bless you all. And we're going to have a new constellation of giving started next week. And we wanted to talk about, yes, uh, starting tomorrow, I'm going on a little vacation. So don't come by and rob my house, please. But uh, <laughs> big joke. You'd have to climb up a bunch of stairs to get there, of course. But um, Tomorrow, we are going to have, not tomorrow, Thursday, is a book signing with this astronaut, Ron Guerin. Ron has built, has, has um, published three books. Uh, the last book is a children's book, and Ron Guerin spent 177 days in space on an expedition uh, uh, on the space station, and I think STS-124 was uh, his first mission. Here he is in the cupola. So come down to the American Space Museum from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock Thursday, this coming Thursday, and get your books autographed. And then Ron is going to be on Stay Curious uh, with uh, our team here, Jessica and, and Marty Winkle uh, behind the camera and audio. And your guest host is going to be Bart Martindale. And sounds like a game show host, of course. Bart Martindale. Bart's a great guy. He's a docent at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex for like three years and as a docent here. So you'll enjoy Bart taking over for me and I'm sure we won't miss a lick uh, to help you stay curious. Tomorrow, 
we're going to have this gentleman, Jamie Draper. Jamie Draper is the director of the Cape Canaveral uh, U.S. Space Force Museums, all right, and he has a 16-year history of being with the Henry, or not Henry Ford, with the President Ford Museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Grand Rapids Presidential Library of uh, our President Gerald Ford. A uh, terrific guy, got to spend some time with him a couple weeks ago, and can't wait for him to get in the museum, and Bart's going to be interviewing him. Bart is one of his docents, so Jamie will have a, some great tales, and we're going to reveal to you Rupert, the armadillo that we want to build a bridge with uh, at the American Space Museum and reach out to particularly young kids out there and turn them on to space. So you'll hear about Rupert, the armadillo, tomorrow when we have Jamie Draper on Stay Curious with your substitute host, Bart Martindale. So let's kick in. To a little bit of space history today as I've took care of enough business there. Um, moon race in 1968. Let me put my glasses on. On this date, September 14, 1968, a Soviet proton rocket blasted off Bakunar launch complex with a spaceship called Zond 5. Zond 5 had on it a payload of two live tortoises and uh, Fruit fly eggs, it had green algae, bacteria, cells of wheat, pine, carrots, tomatoes to test the effects of cosmic radiation. Because this spacecraft, which was what the cosmonauts were going to take to orbit the moon, didn't just didn't orbit the moon, but it did a loop around it like Apollo 13 did. And the first uh, spacecraft to do that in 1968. Now, 1968, all you space aficionados out there, in September 21st, yeah, October, November, December, three months later, Apollo 8 circled the moon with three astronauts, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders, both, all three are still alive. Uh, and that basically sealed the deal that we'd won the moon race. But it was conjectured that after this flight, they were going to send humans to the moon. And knowing the propaganda ploy that the Soviet unions could pull on the world, they pulled a prank on the world, particularly the United States. Because when Zon 5, it was launched today uh, in 1968, uh, September 14th, it looped around the moon three and a half days later, so that was September 18th, it looped around the moon, and headed back to the moon on September 19th, the Soviets broadcast a radio loop from Zon 5 of cosmonauts talking as if they had landed on the moon and talking about it. This caught the attention of the CIA who intercepted this uh, and uh, Jodrell Bank Univ Observatory was a big player in England uh, for intercepting tele uh, radio broadcasts of the Soviet space program and they heard this Two cosmonauts talking to each other like they just come back from the moon and can't wait to go to Earth. It was such a prank that President Lyndon Johnson in the White House was alerted by the CIA and he called NASA to find out what was going on. And they assured him that, that uh, there were no humans on that flight. And when it landed two days later, the turtles were alive. Let's show you a little graphic of that. There's a cool little Zon 5. Look at those cute little tortoises with space helmets on. Like that, like that would say, what does it say there? Two small steps for tortoise kind. Two small steps for tortoise kind, it says there. And there they are alive in a photo I pulled off uh, somewhere on the internet there, but they weren't very big and they, they did survive it. They were a little dehydrated and hungry because they didn't really have a way to feed them, I guess, on the way there. So this was a, a, a dramatic mission that had NASA on it thinking, oh my gosh, you know, we're planning on Apollo 8 in November, and this is September, and boy, by the beginning of November, and I mean December is when Apollo 8 was being planned. Marty's uh, given me the uh, correction there. And uh, so, but the reason why it didn't happen for Russia was their gigantic moon rocket called N1 failed three times. It blew up shortly after launch. It was equivalent to our Saturn V rocket, except it had 30 engines on the bottom of it. Uh, a crazy concept, and they had trouble controlling it every time they launched it. And that's why we won, was Werner von Braun, the architect of the Saturn V rocket, definitely deserves a lot of credit for us beating the Russians 
Uh, and by the way, we did that just seven years after President Kennedy in 1962 said we were going to do it by the end of the decade. And you can just scratch your head and say, hmm, how long has that Orion and Starliner spaceship been working on? Well, a long time. But when we can do it with a war mentality like Marty Winkle says we had when he worked on the lunar module 52 years ago uh, for Grumman out at Kennedy Space Center, that was the attitude was, we're going to do it no matter what. And of course, it took a lot of money and the money was there. But quite an event in 1968 when these two tortoises or, uh, didn't orbit. They were flung around the moon and come back, which was a big deal because that 30,000 mile an hour trajectory coming back from the Earth uh, takes a technique of reentry there so it doesn't uh, burn up. And they succeeded in a successful mission. We're going to talk about another wonderful mission 55 years ago of Gemini 11, and that is the Roman numerals IX, uh, or X1 is Gemini. You'll see it, Gemini, in the, Roman, in the numerals a lot, but they, they won the Roman numerals in Gemini, and they also called it Gemini and not Gemini. And I will someday show you a newspaper clip that I've copied that says NASA is officially saying the proper pronunciation of their two-man program was G Gemini, after Jiminy, like Jiminy Cricket. And you probably got to be a few gray hairs to know who Jiminy Cricket was, which was a Walt Disney character in which movie? Jiminy Cricket was in uh, Pinocchio. Was it Pinocchio? Someone's going to correct us out there. Boy, uh, Marty and I don't know because we're old and our brains are failing and Jessica's too young. So, But there was Jiminy the Cricket was a... <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's been Pinocchio. Uh, but, is it, uh, but Gemini, the constellation, and Gemini is the space program. But we don't care how you say it, just as long as you love our Gemini astronauts. One of the most important programs ever. Ten uh, two-man missions every other month in 1965 and 66. And this one was the next to the last one. It was launched September 12th in 1966, 55 years ago. With these two astronauts on the left is Dick Gordon, and the gap tooth, famously gap tooth astronaut is Pete Conrad, is Charles Conrad, nickname was Pete. Pete was a character, and we hear many stories about him at the American Space Museum. Their mission was to go up and dock with this Agena rocket that was launched up uh, hours before they were inserted into orbit. We had to go to the moon. We had to dock with two vehicles because we had the command module orbiting the Earth and the lunar module went down to the surface. So this is where they practiced this. But they put a tether between the two vehicles and tried to practice some maneuvering with that and some orbital mechanics. And here is Dick Gordon riding the Agena rocket with the Gemini hatch open beforehand. Pete Conrad taking these pictures. He rode it like a cowboy. And they were testing the spacesuit to walk on the moon, specifically on this mission. Apollo Gemini 12 was the last of the missions, and that was uh, Jim Lovell and um, uh, Buzz Aldrin. Yep, uh, and they're both alive. Uh, both these gentlemen have have passed on. So, uh, but what great guys uh, to give you an idea of what it was like to land and how small that Mercury capsule or Gemini capsule was. This is after the landing, which happened on the 15th of September, 55 years ago tomorrow. There's Pete getting out of the hatch. The green dye you see is there to, uh, in the ocean to, to find them if they got lost. The frogmen have already been there because they put the collar around there. They took a helicopter to where they landed and uh, uh, put the collar around it to keep that two-man Gemini with the gold, famous gold wing hatches um, open, uh, bring it back to Earth safely. And to sh share a little bit about what we're about at our nonprofit, the American Space Museum, is to talk about Space View Walk of Fame. And this is just uh, on, the, on the Indian River. This shows you the paver that is there celebrating the Gemini 11 mission with the iconic Roman numeral 2 in the background. And uh, below that Roman numeral 2 is, are etched in marble hundreds of space workers that were the contractors that worked on Gemini. And if you know one of those contractors, we'll take a hundred bucks for you and put your name on that someday. But we only do it about once a year because it's expensive to get an engraver out there to do that. But uh, 
Yes. Contractors and, NASA Co and contractors and NASA employees. Uh, contractor uh, for Grumman, and Marty Winkle wanted to remind everybody, and that's true. Everybody, NASA is the homeowner that hired all the contractors to do things, but they are they were the management, and their names are certainly on there. And uh, several of our board of directors members are on there, like Charlie Mars uh, and, and Lee Solid, and of course Bob Seek. So. Uh, I wanted to share that with you and what this is how we started. All right. In 1999, they started getting handprints of astronauts, uh, an idea they had uh, for the re renaissance of our downtown here in Titusville uh, on Space Coast, Florida. There is Dick Gordon's hands in bronze, the only place in the world you can put your handprints on top of the bronze handprints of some 30 astronauts uh, in our Mercury, Gemini, Apollo areas and then we have a tribute to the shuttle era also at space view park and many of you've been there and seen that when this happened uh pete conrad had already passed away unfortunately and i think pete died in 1999 in a freak motorcycle accident but we put busts of them on there and sandy storm is the awesome artist that did that we saw sandy in our museum not too long ago so uh, want you to come and visit our museum, but the Space View Park is free and open all the time, and it's a beautiful uh, evening uh, walk around if you're here on our Space Coast. Next today in Space History, actually we wanted to think about, and I can't make the show too long to get too detailed about it, but I'll tell you what, on this date in Space History, we have seven shuttle missions orbiting Earth and these three were all launched on September 12th, all right? So you've got, uh, what, 5, 12, and 5 is 17 astronauts there that can say September 12th was the day I went to, to space. And you got STS-48 to the left there in 1991. It was launched a year before STS-47, and I didn't research why, but it did. Uh, they gave these numbers, and sometimes the sequence went out of whack because of something with the orbiter, but most likely something with the payload had to be delayed. And once you start the paperwork, they're not going to change the paperwork of the mission. Uh, but in that, but we have it in, in incredibly one, two, three, four, five years in a row. September uh, uh, on this date in history, we've had shuttles in the air: 48 in 91, STS 47 in 92. 51 in 1993, STS-64 in 1994, STS-69 in 1995. Amazing, isn't it? STS-106 was orbiting the Earth in 2000, uh, doing an ISS mission, of course, and STS-115 was doing a construction mission in 2006. And on the 16th is added the eighth shuttle that will be in space on that date in history. On the 16th, STS-79 a mission to take John Blaha up to the Mir Space Station and bring back Shannon Lucid. So we will hopefully talk to Triple T, uh, uh, Travis Thompson, about these busy Septembers. We're not going to guarantee Travis will be here Friday, but we're hoping he can be. He's feeling a lot better, but uh, uh, we're always being cautious about everybody's health in the building here. So, uh, But Triple T, here's your prayers and, and, and wishes for him to get well, and he is. Uh, so he might be here Friday, and, and uh, we'll announce that uh, Friday morning on our regular Facebook. So isn't that amazing, all these shuttles uh, of, in September? Uh, just just a, a, a routine there in the 1990s. It's uh, middle of September. Let's launch a shuttle. Yeah, birthdays in, October, in August. And right, yeah. She, in yeah, she's point, uh, Jessica's pointing out we have in a two-week span about 25 astronauts have birthdays in August, and here we have in a, a week span uh, eight or nine shuttle missions orbiting Earth, as well as Gemini uh, uh, tw 11 at this time in history, and I think there's a Soyuz spacecraft in history too. So we do have, we love our shuttle astronauts, and we can't wait to see Ron Guerin here up close and personal. He'll be autographing his one of his uh, three books. We have all three books here to buy we got plenty of them, so please come and check us out, and I'll, I'll announce that if you call us or message us, we will get a, a book signed by Ron Guerin for you, 
and uh, we'll get you online and you can pay for it and pay for the postage and we'll get you a personal uh, a book from Ron Guerin. I'm sure he'll love to do that and we'd love to help reach out to you that way. But a couple astronaut birthdays today. Uh, Marty and uh, Jessica, uh, first happy birthday to the first Vietnamese in orbit, American Vietnamese. Happy birthday to Eugene Hu Cha uh, Trin. He's 71 today, and he was born in Saigon, South uh, Vietnam, in 1950 on September 14th. Moved with his parents, of course, to Paris, France when he was two years old. He came to the United States to study when he was 18, become an American citizen. And uh, Gene Trin was a payload specialist and crew member of STS-50, Orbiter Columbia, a microgravity lab experiment in 1992. So we wish a 70, happy 71st birthday to him. I couldn't find any recent photos of him. So that's a photo of him back in his 1992 days. And a special happy birthday to John Bennett Harrington, and that's with an H-E-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. He is 63 today, and though he is a one-time astronaut on STS-113, he did three EVAs, extravehicular activities, spacewalking on three hard hat uh, construction missions on the ISS on his mission in 2002. Harrington is the first... Uh, person of a Native American heritage in America to go to space. He is a Chickasaw uh, member, Chickasaw Nation. He was born in Wetumpka, Oklahoma on September 14, 1958. And John Harrington uh, is frequently on the Space Coast. He's a good friend with Triple T. And we want, uh, I wouldn't doubt that someday we'll have John Harrington on a Stay Curious program. If not live, we'll, we'll do it on uh, either Zoom or Google Meets is what we're going to try down the road here. But Harrington's authored a children's book that's very popular, Mission to Space. Um, and in his book, he shares his passion for space travel and provides a glimpse into his astronaut training and his international space uh, station mission. And the book includes English to Chickasaw vocabulary list with space-related terms. And uh, so we can't wait to talk to him personally about that. In fact, uh, Triple T uh, frequently gets uh, uh, text from John, one of the astronauts that uh, Travis has been in touch with uh, over his career of loading those astronauts into the orbiters before they blasted off in that white room 195 feet up in the air. So happy birthday to uh, Gene Trin and John Harrington. Many, many more to you guys. And with that, we're so grateful to everybody that has chimed in. Uh, we've got a comment or a question. Oh, we're going to close out with our Galaxy of Giving, our first uh, constellation, our first uh, uh, that we've created thanks to your wonderful donations. There's almost $12,000 worth of donations there, folks. We are very grateful. And with that, have used it wisely under the direction of our executive director, Karen Conklin, to buy the equipment we needed. And lots of the things we're buying, we're sharing with our important STEAM education programs that we do here. And, and you'll hear more about as uh, we're developing those programs. Your logo here, your face, your, your dog, your pet, we're going to start putting those up uh, here. And there is Jessica in her Star Trek science officer's uniform, correct? She's hatching your dreams into reality, and she's sure done a hell of a job here at the American Space Museum. We're wonderful to have her on board, uh, along with her husband, Troy, who's talented also, and are really helping us shape up our Stay Curious for you out there, our wonderful followers. So until tomorrow, when you will be having a Jamie... Um, uh, Jamie's last name is Jamie Draper. <laughs> Until uh, Bart Martindale sits in this seat for me while I go on vacation, Jamie Draper will be here telling you about being the director at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Museums out there. And until then, I'm Mark Marquette. Join them, and we can't wait to see you in the museum to bridge the space between us.